recording this meeting uh, and put it on YouTube later on. All those of you who would like to ask questions, you can type them in the chat box or you can, uh, there is a raise hand feature or you can just, when the time has come, wave into the camera and we will be seeing you and then we can also take your questions at the end. Thank you very much. And without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Sarvatma Prabhu. Uh, just give me one second. I'm gonna get a, a, a separate uh, speaker because the, the sound that comes to me is very, very low. One second. Can you say something? We can hear you now, but the sound got a bit worse. Yeah, it was worse. It was better a few minutes. better before? Okay. That's really muffled. Uh, I'll turn it off. Yeah, that sounds better. All right, very good. So let's begin. Without further ado, thank you for tuning in. You're uh, probably like most of us on lockdown. The sound is still very muffled. We can hardly hear you. Okay. It's an old computer. I have. Uh, I can also do it by phone. See if it gets any better. Hear me better with the phone? That's very echoey. Okay, let me see if I, if I mute. Oh, du musstest das iPhone von ihm unmuten. Okay. okay, can oh, you hear me now? Yes, so there's an echo. I think you are logged in with, no, you're logged in with only one device, I see. No, um, should I log, get out of one device? Uh, we, we can hear you on this device, on your iPhone. And it's the only um, other device that's unmuted. Yeah. Can you say something now? Can you try? Just let me uh, let me turn the computer that off. Sounds good. It sounds good. Is it better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay, very good. Now I can't see anybody except for you. There you go. But I, I don't see the others that are logged in on uh, on the web. Is that normal? You have to swipe to the right or to the left to see the others. Okay. Got it. Very good. All right, so let's begin. Since is the Bhagavad Gita, this is this chapter four. Is uh, there's a lot of famous verses in it. It starts right from a get go, and finally gets to this Bhagavad Gita four seven, where Krishna says that he comes personally and doesn't send any avatars, doesn't send any prophets. This is, this is just himself. So please let's begin together by saying uh, that prayer that um, made Dhruva Maharaj go back to Godhead in only six months, become Krishna conscious. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. I guess you're all muted, so I will, 
I will imagine that you're singing. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. So this is uh, what Narad Muni gave Dhruva Maharaj as a, as a mantra to, to achieve everything he wanted, which was actually Krishna, as he himself confessed. So this is the verse for today. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutanam dharmasya tatatmanam sri jamiaham. And uh, if you ask any Indian anywhere uh, about this verse, they all know it. This is the, uh, and, you know, they sing it everywhere. And uh, Janmastami, big verse. So this is uh, the translation by Srila Prabhupada. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. And this is with capital M, because Krishna is saying, I, I come personally. Why would Krishna choose to come personally? Because everything gets lost in the material world. Everything deteriorates. That's the nature of this world. So he has to come himself because nobody else can fix it. It's like, you know, you can, it's like calling, calling um, tech support. You know, you can call them, they can give you advice, but there's things that you can't do even with the help of uh, experts. So a technician has to come home or you have to take the, your computer to, to the store and they, they can fix it. So Krishna, um, sometimes has to show up. He naturally shows, as we are gonna hear from a purport. The word Sri Jami is significant herein. Sri Jami cannot be used in the sense of creation because according to the previous verse, there is no creation of the Lord's form or body since all of the forms are eternally existent. Therefore, Sri Jami means that the Lord manifests himself as he is. Although the Lord appears on schedule, namely at the end of Dwapara Yuga, of the 28th millennium of the seventh Manu in one day of Brahma, he has no obligation to adhere to such rules and regulations because he is completely free to act in many ways at his will. So um, there, is a, there is one of these philosophers to which Bhakti Thakur offered his obeisances from far away, uh, Jaimini Kavi, who um, proposed the um, karma mimamsa philosophy. In other words, God creates certain rules and then he should be a good sport and he has to follow them. But that's not the position of God. God doesn't have to f follow his rules. We may have to follow the rules. Like here, if, if the uh, um, jurisprudence, the judges, the lawmakers make a law, it's not like they make it for everybody else and they don't have to follow. They have to follow it too. But in the case of Krishna, Krishna makes some laws and some rules, and then he can follow them or break them. Although he, he tends to follow them. He says he doesn't want the, the world to give a bad example to the world or that the world goes into chaos. So he, he decides to actually follow most of the time. But uh, again, he ends at the end of Dwapara Yuga, and in the 28th millennium of the seventh Manu and a day of Brahma, he shows up. Yeah, he's scheduled to show up. And that's actually one way how you can tell an avatar. Like someone can claim uh, I'm an avatar of Vishnu, but let me, let me see the day timer. Oh no, buddy, you're not, you're not written on in here. So you're not an avatar, I'm sorry. You know, even if you can show some mystic power or some, some other silly stuff. So when Krishna appears, it's because there is a predominance of irreligiosity. He therefore appears by his own will, wherever there is a predominance of irreligiosity and a disappearance of true religion. Principle of, principles of religion are laid down in the Vedas and any discrepancy in the matter of properly executing the rules of the Vedas makes one irreligious. Now this may sound like a contradictory, uh, not a contradictory, but a, a polemical statement. The Prabhupada says that 
principles of religion are laid down in the Vedas, and any discrepancy in the matter of properly executing the rules of the Vedas makes one irreligious. We, uh, what about the other religions? What about Christians, Jews, Muslims? Well, there are certain principles in the Vedas that are followed by all religions. So it's, they don't have to be uh, directly um, doing it from the Vedas, but they can do it from one of the um, Upadharmas, those processes that help one um, pass the simple barrier of morality and ethics like you. In other words, if you're not a good person, uh, then you may need a lot of moral instruction and a lot of um, ethical proposals, like, you know, behave yourself. Just like a commandments, they're not they're not bad, it's just uh, they're meant for people who didn't have much of a sense of uh, what's right and what's wrong. Um, just, you wouldn't invite anybody at home, at, at your place, you know, for dinner, and, uh, and then before, before they come into the door, say, okay, let's, let's agree that you're not gonna kill uh, my pets or, and eat them. You're not gonna have sex with my wife. You're not gonna uh, mistreat my parents. You're not gonna steal anything. Uh, you better not invite people like that. But that's that's simply uh, a, the commandments, in other words, which are meant for people who didn't have much sense of direction. So it's not bad. It's just a, it's a preparation for receiving true spiritual life, which means to understand the soul. The soul is very subtle. Uh, God is is. is Unlimited. How do you understand the unlimited with that limited mind? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said in the preface and the foreword to the Brahma Samhita that you can actually put the entire material creation through your senses and mind and still you wouldn't understand anything. Uh, nothing will stay because they are, they are beyond your comprehension. So with a small mind, and with imperfect senses, it's very difficult to understand anything. So we have to take shelter of a guru, have to take shelter of saintly people, sadhus, and princip principally, we have to take shelter of Shastra. That's, that's the main guidance for those who are blind. In, in this age, everybody's blind. There's not, no exceptions. Manda sumanda matayo manda bhagya upadrita. This is a bad age. Kal Kaleda, uh, Hello, Sudra, Sambhava, everybody's uh, less intelligent and doesn't have any idea about spiritual life. And to understand spiritual life, you have to understand who you are. Uh, if you don't understand who you are, then you can't understand what you're supposed to be doing either. And certainly you won't understand uh, the Supreme Godhead. That's a, that's a very difficult proposal. So in the Bhagavatam, this is, this is a light for this age. The Bhagavatam is the most shining example of Shastra. Like all different Shastras, they treat about many, many topics, but in the Bhagavatam is where you find the light because the Bhagavatam is a beautiful story of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his devotees. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is never alone. He is always surrounded by loving devotees. So this loving relationship is the crux of the whole Bhagavatam. And you see examples of how small devotees make it big and how big devotees make a lot of blunders so in the bhagavatam is a is a guide so we can um we can see that there is hope even for us because some of like indra and brahma indra decided to flood um, vrindavan and didn't go very well and lord rama decided to steal the coward boys and the calves and that pastime didn't go very well either. So these are, these are the, the big head honchos here in the material universe, and they do very well. And small devotees who, you know, due to their humility, they, uh, they make great progress. Of course, some were eternal associates of either Krishna or Lord Chaitanya, but it's possible to go from wherever we are in any position to the greatest achievement. And the greatest achievement is actually to be 
to feel lower than the, a blade of grass and more taller than a tree and devoid of sense of false prestige, giving respect to others. That's the greatest achievement, to become a servant of a servant of a servant and to feel insignificant because insignificance is poorly understood. Insignificance is actually a very good thing. You think, oh, I'm, I'm not number one, I'm not even number two. You will never be, you'll never be. In the spiritual world, all the posts are taken, servant of a servant is taken, servant of a servant of a servant is taken, all, all of them are taken. The only posts that are not taken is servant of a servant of a servant of a servant, et cetera, et cetera, a million times. And those are uh, places of privilege because everybody's trying to help those who are um, further away, apparently. But the further away you are in this spiritual world, the closer you are. And in, this, in the material world, if you go to a stadium to, to watch um, Hertha Berlin and you got a cheap ticket and you're up, up in the boonies where you know, it's so high that your nose starts bleeding, then uh, obviously you can't see the, the game very well from where you are. That's the material world. But in the spiritual world, the further you are, the closer you get. So in the Bhagavatam, it is stated that such principles are the laws of the Lord. Only the Lord can manufacture a system of religion. The Vedas are also accepted as originally spoken by the Lord himself to Brahma from within his heart. Therefore, the principles of Dharma or religion are the direct orders of the Supreme Personality of God, Dharman to Sakshat Bhagavad Pranitam. So this is uh, another indication that we cannot come up with stuff, that you cannot manufacture something. You cannot wake up from a dream and create a new religion or a new Shastra unless you are in power by the Supreme Lord. And religion, like anything else, comes with the Supreme. Dharmam tu shakshad Bhagavad Pranitam, Bhagavad, from God. These principles are clearly indicated throughout the Bhagavad Gita. The purpose of the Vedas is to establish such principles under the order of the Supreme Lord. And the Lord directly orders at the end of the Gita that the highest principle of religion is to surrender unto him only and nothing more. Now, there is another interesting point here, surrender. What, what in the world does that mean, surrender? I thought I surrendered when I joined the Hare Krishna movement. I, I thought I surrendered when I promised to chant 16 rounds every day. I try to surrender every day. When, when is enough? When is Krishna going to accept my surrender? Uh, is there a different category of surrender? And if you remember, that's not the last verse of the Gita. It's kind of the conclusion in 18 chapter 65-66, where Madhvana Baba Mat Bhakto become my devotee, offer homages to me, etc. And then the next verse is surrender, abandon all varieties of religion, all speculation, just surrender to me. I'll protect you, I'll take care of you. Do not worry. Now, there is more. And after after those verses, Krishna asked. Arjuna I said I um, I think I spoke quite a bit about all the different things that you wanted to hear you know my opulence and the different types of devotional service and different types of people who surrender to me and people who don't uh, about the uh, three mo modes of material nature uh, we spoke about a lot of stuff and then I arrived at the conclusion that if you become my devotee, and I tell you this, he said, because you are my friend, Bhakto Mi Me Saka, you're my devotee and my friend, so I can speak confidentially with you. No, knowing all this, did you understand? Did you get it? And if you did, what are you gonna do about it? So this is, this is Krishna's liberal um, take on things, because he didn't say, surrender or else i'll burn you forever in a lake of fire he says okay i explained to you as much as i could you know because obviously they were they had some time constraints because uh arjuna was busy killing his family so he didn't want to interrupt too much of that so now if you have understood that what are you gonna do what are you gonna do so this is, uh, this is how Krishna interacts. It's never a forced situation. Like one may say, well, 
Krishna could have forced me to to become a devotee. He could have forced me to stay in the in the spiritual world. He could force me to love him, even because what is opposing this idea is is my own false ego, which is not real. So why not Krishna force me? Because Krishna doesn't want slaves. Just like if someone someone follows you all day like a puppy and has no personal ideas and depends completely on on you telling telling them everything this is what you should do this is how you should do it no krishna doesn't want zombies he wants individuals that voluntarily turn towards krishna and say yes i do need you i want you i rather have nothing else but you i understood i've been wasting my time and now i i accept you this you're my all in all and i have nothing nothing to gain from doing anything else that's what krishna wants but it's it's not because his ego is is hurt uh, oh you know his there are a few guys and girls missing and they, they didn't want to make it to to so go ahead and force them no krishna krishna is having fun don't don't uh, think that you are that important or i am that important none of us is but we are part and parcel of krishna so he cares he cares deeply. We are part. It's like uh, family members that you never met before, and you find out there's, these are family members. They are blood. So Krishna has blood everywhere. I mean, not in the morbid sense. And he wants to reunite with all of them. He wants the whole family to be together. So, but doesn't want people to, to be forced. Oh, no, I have to go to that family gathering again. That is terrible. I, I, I'm bored. I... I have nothing to say and I can't hear what they say because they're all boring and uninteresting and we have nothing in common. Well, we have a lot in common. We actually, once, once you actually achieve this, this state of grace, which is to actually accept Krishna and accept that you are not number one and you're not going to make it in the material world and you're very small, fragmental, part and parcel of Krishna and that you have a chance, an enormous chance to make it back to Godhead, then you will achieve peace. You'll have everything you have ever wanted and more and more. You actually, your chest won't be able to uh, support the enormous flow from your heart of love towards Krishna and towards everyone because everybody's part and parcel of Krishna. You can't love people and not love Krishna. You have to go the other way around. First, you have to love Krishna, and then you will love everyone. There will be no discrimination. Like, um, <clears throat> sometimes I'm having trouble with somebody, and I have to think, oh, how, how am I going to, I'm going to have to carry this, these feelings, you know, and it's, it's going to be an impediment. But I, I started thinking, no, these people are my ticket way go to going back to god to actually learn how to love him and tolerate him and I, just as they tolerate me this is this is what is gonna help me make it back so i should welcome everything that comes because krishna is sending all sorts of things through his internal energy and uh, a lot of times through the external energy because maya is there we're reading from the fourth canto right now where sati who is actually a representation of Mahamaya, is, is about to give up her body because um, Lord Shiva was involved, insulted by her father, Daksha, and she said, I, <clears throat> I don't want to even remember that it come, my body comes from, your, from you, so I'm, I'm going to give up my body because I, I have just, you know, I, I'm, we're done, mm -hmm. we're done. So we don't have to be this this drastic we have to understand that maya is actually um not necessarily tricking us but is actually trying to make us strong by bringing more and more tests so you become stronger and stronger and stronger in spiritual life because there is no way that uh, a wimp will go back to godhead there's you have to become a very strong person you have to overcome a lot of obstacles. And if you think, well, I, I haven't had any obstacles, 
uh, is probably because you already went through them in, the, in your past life. So now you're, you, know, you have a smooth ride. But most of us don't. We have to go through a lot of different exercises to make our muscles bigger. And we may shake a little bit after exercising a lot because that's the nature of the beast. You, you become weaker for a little bit and then you become stronger. The energy comes back and your muscles become bigger. So, the Vedic principles push one towards complete surrender unto him. And whenever such principles are disturbed by the demonic, the Lord appears. From Bhagavatam, we understand that Lord Buddha is the incarnation of Krishna who appeared when materialism was rampant and materialists were using the pretext of the authority of the Vedas. Although there are certain restrictive rules and regulations regarding animal sacrifice for particular purposes in the Vedas, people of demonic tendency still look to animal sacrifice without reference to the Vedic principles. Lord Buddha appeared in order to stop this nonsense and to establish the Vedic principles of nonviolence. Therefore, each and every avatar, <coughs> excuse me, or incarnation of the Lord has a particular mission and they're all described in the revealed scriptures. No one should be accepted as an avatar unless he is referred to by scriptures. It is not a fact that the Lord appears only on Indian soil. He can manifest himself anywhere and everywhere and whenever he desires to appear. In each and every incarnation, he speaks as much about religion as can be understood by the particular people under the particular circumstances. But the mission is the same, to lead people to God consciousness and obedience to the principles of religion. Sometimes he descends personally, and sometimes he sends his bona fide representative in the form of his son or servant or himself in some disguised form. So any bona fide avatar, like um, Lord Buddha, although Lord Buddha was a, a, in the Jiva category, he was a Shaktavesha avatar, and his purpose was pretty simple, to stop violence, and he did. And then in order to do that, he had to deny the authority of the Vedas. So that was, that was a bit of a stretch. But then Krishna sent Shankara, an incarnation of Shiva, to reestablish the Vedas as authority. But he couldn't give the full explanation. So he presented his, his own agenda, uh, kind of an impersonal view. And then Lord Chaitanya came to you know, close the deal, just reestablish the Achintya Veda Veda Tattva, the personalist, um, approach of the Vedas, which is the real meaning. Okay, the last paragraph of a, of a purpose goes, the principles of the Bhagavad Gita were spoken to Arjuna and for that matter, to other highly elevated persons because he was highly advanced compared to ordinary persons in other parts of the world. Two plus two equals four is a mathematical principle that is true in the beginner's arithmetic class and in the advanced class as well. Still, there are higher and lower math. In all incarnations of the Lord, therefore, the same principles are taught, but they appear to be higher and lower in varied circumstances. The higher principles of religion begin with the acceptance of the four orders and the four statuses of social life, as will be explained later. The whole purpose of the mission of incarnations is to arouse Krishna consciousness everywhere. Such consciousness is manifest and non-manifest only under different circumstances. So, according to time and circumstance, Krishna appears and the, there is a time, as, he, as this, the, the verse itself, that when irreligion gets rampant and then he has to show up in person, which is, it's okay, it's, it's his world that he created and he wants to fix it and nobody else can. He can do it online, he can call tech support, you know, this, this world is going to help. Uh, can you help me? Can you guide me? What should I go? What, what icon should I, what, what app can help me? It has to come, the manufacturer has to come and fix it himself. So Krishna comes and everything is fine and he accomplishes a lot of, lot of things. But he comes only uh, every day of Brahma, which is um, not so often. So don't wait until Krishna comes and grabs your hand and takes you back to Adit. Try to make an effort, like they say, uh, there was a joke about a guy who wanted to win the lottery so bad that prayed to God day and night. And finally God appeared to him and said, let's meet halfway. How about you buy a ticket first? 
So this is the, this is the deal. You cannot just ask Krishna to do everything for you. You have to meet him halfway. Uh, practice devotional service, associate with devotees, chant your rounds seriously, uh, practice as much as you can of devotional service, read the scriptures, especially the Bhagavatam, the Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita. And again, very important association of devotees because when you're by yourself, you're very indulgent or you can go the other way. You, you can be uh, deprecating and self-flagellating and trying to punish yourself. I'm so fallen, I'm so low, I can never make progress, etc. That's a different type of sense gratification. You, uh, you console yourself by saying how low you are and then you have an excuse not to make progress. You have to be in the, in the middle somehow or other because Krishna speaks about a true yogi being a moderate person, not an extremist, not someone who fasts you know, every day, all day, or tortures himself, or uh, doesn't sleep very much. You know, this, is, this is not what Krishna intended. He is our loving father. You cannot please your father by torturing yourself. That's, that's true for your family, and that's true for Krishna, who is our real father and mother and lover and maintainer. Okay, so on that note, we'll, uh, we'll open up for reflections and questions and uh, chastisements. Maybe you can help me make spiritual advancement by telling me how bad I am and how terrible the body I, I am, if I am a body at all. So unmute yourselves and go for it. I hope I was connected so far. Thank you very much, Sarvatma Prabhu. So if anyone of those of you who are joining us here on this online Zoom call have any questions, you can, as I said, either type them into the chat box or since uh, that would take quite a lot of time, uh, why not just unmute yourself by clicking on this uh, little microphone icon in the left-hand corner of your screen and then you can just speak. So, Vatma Prabhu, thank you for the wonderful class. Um, a little bit connected to your last point. Sometimes devotees think that a devotional service, which is difficult for me, which breaks my false ego, which is unpalatable to myself, or which is something I don't like to do, this is what will give me spiritual advancement the fastest, and I should rather avoid something that I enjoy doing, doing for Krishna. Is this in the same category as what you were talking about in the end? Well, not necessarily. Sometimes it may be the same thing. Uh, like you have a, a favorite service to do and you think, well, this is, this, is, uh, but this is too easy because I already know how. This is not gonna give me as much advancement as, as forcing myself to do a service that uh, someone else uh, is doing and I despise or don't like. Like, I don't like, I don't know, I don't, I, wash floors, for example. It's not my favorite service. So I should do that in order to make quick advancement. And uh, chanting for the deities, which I love to do, uh, is something I should avoid because it's, it's too easy, because I like to do it. Uh, I think in the beginning, everybody has to wash floors and wash pots and do whatever, whatever you're told. And then eventually, when, once your uh, false ego is a little bit under control, because again, if you live in the association of devotees, your false ego won't be able to get very far because the devotees will stop you. They will, they will tell you what's wrong with you. Even they will volunteer that information. You don't even need to ask them. So once you get a little purified, then you may be able to find, I mean, Krishna, is, is in the beginning, it's is very easy. It's like, it's like chanting. You start chanting Japa, uh, first day, second day, first week as a devotee, and you're in heaven. You think, oh my God, because you finally achieve some peace because Krishna gives you a special layer of pleasure associated with the chanting. But, you know, 40 years later, when you're chanting, you don't have the same way, not 40 years later, 20 days later, 
Krishna takes the pleasure out of chanting and see, okay, how do you like it now? Are you attached to me, to my name, or are you are attached to the pleasure you got from chanting? So then you have to start the struggle because you have to achieve the same state of consciousness that you had, but minus the pleasure. So the pleasure is just a distraction. That's why, you know, you, a, a sober person, a dira, is someone who is not disturbed by pleasure or pain. Come, come whatever comes, you will be uh, in Krishna's service. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote a verse here that I, uh, I put it on, on my Kirtan website that I love from Madhavendra Puri. Said, let the sharp moralist accuse me of being illusion. I do not mind. Experts in Vedic activities may slander me as being misled. Friends and relatives may call me frustrated. My brothers may call me a fool. The wealthy Mammonites may point, out, may point me out as mad. And the learned philosophers may assert that I am much too proud. Still, my mind does not budge an inch from the determination to serve the lotus feet of Govinda, though I be unable to do it. This is uh, from Madhavendra Puri. So you may find your service, uh, your, the service that you will be doing for the rest of your life a week after you join the movement, uh, you know, at home. And you may not find it until the very last days of your existence in the material world. Basically, you have to go with the program. And Krishna, through the devotees, through the guru, through Shastra, through sadhus, is um, they're a combination that make the perfect trainer. Like you go to a, a gym and you get a personal trainer and he will actually work on the, on the parts of your body that are weak and make them stronger. So somehow or other, we all have our own program designed by the ultimate trainer, which is Krishna himself. And he knows what you need and he will send it your way. So do not try to do someone else's service because it's more difficult or because it's easier. Just let Krishna choose it for you. It's like, um, it's, a, it's an obvious choice. Why, why allow a small-minded person like myself uh, create my own program? If we have Krishna who knows everything and is, is kind and knows how to make your life better. So follow the program and associate with devotees, always, always. And this is something that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur mentions over and over, that one should avoid the association of those who are not favorable to devotional service and always associate with those who are favorable. That is the secret of success. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you, brother, that you don't know. Even that you knew already. Thank you <laughs> for giving Thank me you. the chance. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or reflections or things that are related or unrelated? There is a question from our temple audience and uh, he can be seen in this. Thank you for the direction. Yeah, and maybe it's not related to your lecture, but for me it's very interesting. What helps you uh, uh, keep uh, your devotional service? What is uh, the general idea uh, in, inside you <laughs> that helps you to continue devotional service? Thank you, Hare Krishna. Uh, I'm a stubborn person, so I, am, I have a hard time giving up projects that I start. So I started this project of becoming, trying to become a devotee many decades ago and I, I, I'm unable to give it up. No, I, I don't care, come hell or high fire, high, high water, I'm not giving up, you know, even though people suggest that I do, <laughs> just to leave their association, still, I won't do it. And I always, I always chant, I always chant, this, this is important. The holy name is, is the, the link to all other services. So you always have to keep chanting. You, you, if you make a vow, which I highly recommend, um, some, some of you may not be chanting 16 rounds, may be chanting one round or four rounds or eight rounds, whatever you're chanting, do not diminish. This is 
this is your lifesaver. This will keep you afloat, the modes of nature. And the modes of nature are just waiting to take you away. So keep chanting, that is crucial. Again, association of the bodies, keep chanting, read the scriptures, attend if you can, regular classes, uh, because you will, they will refresh these realizations that we, uh, we, we may all know. I mean, how many times have you heard, you're not the body? So, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times? And tell me, honestly, have you realized that you're not the body? Are you off the bodily platform? No. So I guess it will have to be a few more hundred thousand times that it will be repeated until you get the point. So you may think, well, this is boring. Yes, but um, that is the mind. The mind is just trying to trick you all day long. So what do you do? Uh, don't listen to the mind so often and listen to the devotees. And when you eat, I'm sure we all do this several times a day. Uh, make sure you offer it to Krishna with love and devotion. Whatever you do, do with love and devotion. And Krishna will keep you, even if you're not deserving. He, at that point, he doesn't care. He's, he will get used to you hanging around and he will keep you just like, like a pet. You know, the, the dog is old, he can't see, he's missing a leg. Well, yeah, if I'm not going to kill him now. I had him for several decades. So we want to be Krishna's dogs and hang around the house, even if we are of no use. We are not guardians. We, are, we don't play with the kids. We don't, we don't do anything. We just hang up. And because, because you have some affection and because Krishna has a lot more affection for you than you have for him, uh, you will still be around. So devotional service is not some dry process that you buy on the internet and you know, this should work. It's not like one, two, and you know, plug it in. You have to actually put the effort. And, and the effort comes regularly. It's not like you uh, sign in the dotted line, yeah, I'm a devotee, I'm done. Now I don't have to do anything. Just you keep trying, keep trying, because Maya is around the corner and waiting for you. We are actually holding on to Krishna's lotus feet for dear life. And guess what? Maya is holding on to your feet for dear life. So if you let go of Krishna's feet, you're gone. You be, will be covered and you will appear somewhere else. That's how Maya works. Maya doesn't want you to bloop or to, to become fallen, but if you take shelter of Krishna, and that's a that's program. If you don't, then Maya will pull you away because if she's doing the weeding. You know, if you grow a garden, uh, half of it, half of it, 90% of it is weeding. You plant the seeds, you water, but weeding is all of it. So Maya is the weeder of the, of the world. It's just trying to, trying to take the weeds out of Krishna's garden. So don't become a weed. Try to grow straight and don't become attached to Maya because Maya has nothing to offer you. So it's only Krishna who is making it important or substantial. Everything else is, is phantasmagoria. It's like a dream. No matter what you add to your dream, it's always a dream. We have to wake up. So chanting is essential. Association with the Buddhists is essential. Listening to Bhagavatam class regularly, reading the scriptures, and have fun because there's a lot of pleasure in these activities. Is that, is that okay? Anything else from the Northern Europeans? You guys are all thoughtful people. Come on, come up with something. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Savatma Prabhu. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Or Step by. Please uh, excuse, my English is not, is not so good. Um, I'm very grateful for your lecture. Uh, what you said is very, very relevant for me at, um, at, this, uh, at this time. Uh, that uh, Maya sends, on, uh, sends us a lot of 
difficulties to test us. I have a very <laughs> intense testing <laughs> testing period in this time. And you said uh, always associate with devotees. And my main test, as I, I, I live in the north of Germany, and there is no temple in this area. I don't uh, I don't have very much uh, association at my place. And I had especially uh, challenges with devotees that I thought, oh, uh, will Krishna tell me I, I shall better I shall better work uh, alone and it's better it's better to concentrate on 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 my on my single path. <laughs> it's an actual ex experience. Uh, can be right, can be wrong. Uh, I'm 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 not sure, but uh, yeah, uh, Maya is is testing us a lot, and I'm therefore I'm very very grateful for your for your helping words. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that I can help in any way. Uh, you know, at times, um, you may have to do a little bit of a retreat. Like, let's say you have to write a book. You cannot write it in the ashram. That's not going to work. You have to just be by yourself, and you have to avoid phone calls and WhatsApp and texts and everything else. You have to, you, you cannot log on to your computer because you will see that you have a lot of e emails. So you have to write a book. You just put everything aside. Or you are practicing some sort of social distancing like everybody's doing nowadays. And that's a good excuse to be alone. You know, that's the time that you can use to be alone. Now, associating with devotees doesn't mean that you invite, you know, a whole brahmachari team to live in your house. Associating with devotees means you actually have developed friendship with devotees, uh, significant friendship, and you develop eventually develop trust. And if you have one friend in life, you should consider yourself lucky. So, what to speak of whole temples full of that? What I'm saying about association of devotees is you should consider that these people uh, are actually uh, being guided by Krishna. So if you want to hear Krishna's voice, he may be speaking through a lot of people. And if you can't distinguish very well, well, listen to the devotees because Krishna will probably choose to speak from the devotee's mouth more than from others. So they will, they will tell you, you know, and, and don't, take, don't take things, I mean, I, I, I'm giving good advice, but I'm not following myself. I take everything personally as, you know, any, any, anything that anybody says, I, I'll take it personally. Yes, it's very difficult. And I have to, I have to learn that is Krishna speaking to me as a form of instruction. That is not directed to, you know, my, to bash my false ego, make me feel bad about it. Association of devotees means the devotees always have Krishna in their hearts and Krishna in the center. If Krishna's in the center, then you can be, like we just moved to, to this place, Denver, Colorado. We were in Santa Barbara, California for the last 26 years. And because of COVID, we had to close our business and move. And now uh, we live in a community. Uh, we, we have a, a little house, which is two blocks from the temple. And we go to the morning programs, we give classes, we listen to classes, we share prasadam, we invite people over, the Easter courses take place here, the birthday parties take place here. And it's a, it's a new experience for me. Um, um, I remember being a brahmachari or running centers. Yeah, I had a house full of devotees and I live with them. But, you know, I'm an old guy now. You know, I, I, I deserve some peace in my life, right? No, Krishna had a different idea. Krishna says, oh, you know, you're not a finished product yet. You still have a very strong um, sense of independence and your false ego is out of whack and I, you think you know everything, so I have a special program for you. You're gonna associate with people that are uh, mostly your juniors, and they're gonna, they're gonna drive you insane. So that's, that's my program for you, so take it. So sure, sure, what, what else can I do? I, I see, again, I see these people as my ticket back to Godhead, because uh, if you had to work on the things that you think you need to work on, then you wouldn't work at all. Because you, we, most of us think, oh, I'm doing just fine. I just had a few little details to work on. 
No, our heart is completely polluted. It's completely filled with stuff, filled with garbage. Just, uh, I, I, I don't know in, in Germany, but you know, in, in America, people have attics and the attics are full of furniture that will never be used, toys that will never be brought back to life. They have electronic equipment, books that they will never read, uh, boxes full of cans that, that, of food that expire, uh, you know, when, when Mussolini was in power. It, this, is, this is just an attic. It's full of garbage. And as long as you don't go to the attic, you don't, you don't know, you're not bothered because you don't live in the attic. But the, our heart is like the attic. You don't live in the heart, you live in your head. So when you go to your heart and you turn the light on, you will see how dirty the place is and how many useless stuff there is. So practicing devotional service, chanting regularly, associating with devotees, as painful as that, that may be, is, is a good way to start moving stuff in the attic and getting rid of it. Uh, because if they're, in, if they're boxes and they're closed and you don't look at them, then you will never get rid of them. But if you open and see, oh, this is totally useless. I have a collection of newspapers from 1962. What am I going to do with them? So the heart is full of stuff like lust, anger, greed, madness, illusion, pride, envy. And unless you open it, you never see it. You think, ah, I'm okay. I, I can do with that. But guess what? You go to the uh, border with the spiritual world and you think you're going to get in with the boxes. You're not getting anywhere. You got to get rid of all of it. So what's the fastest way? Yes, Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sashri Hoi. Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Sarva Siddhi, all mystic perfection is achieved by Lava Matra or Sadhu Sangha. Lava Matra is a, is a fraction. It's one eleventh of a second. So one eleventh of a second associating with saintly people will get rid of all the garbage that you have. What to speak a longer time? What to speak if you live in a community? So it is important. Uh, however, as I said in the beginning, sometimes you have to take your time aside, you know, it, just to, it's like, uh, it's like music. You cannot just write music and put notes next to each other without any pauses, because it will sound like a cacophony. It will sound horrible. There will be no non-stop. In order to make it beautiful, there should be pauses everywhere. So take your time out, back in, out in, out in, you know, and make your association worthwhile, that you don't resent the association of the bodies because you, that's all you have. Take your time out, get back in, in a renewed way. Like, uh, like relationships between people, between husband and wife. Uh, when, there is a, when there is a disagreement, when there is a fight, take time out. Come back in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour. And then you won't even remember what you were fighting about. So this is, the, this is my advice to you. Yes, being by yourself is fine. But being with devotees is just or as important. So do not learn to appreciate your time alone and learn to appreciate your time with devotees equally. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, it seems that decluttering has become a trend nowadays. So to declutter your attic, your basement, your entire home. And so uh, we should also be decluttering our hearts, I guess. And uh, there is a question from our audience. Okay. Hare Krishna, thank you for your Hare Krishna. Lecture. I have a, a question regarding you told uh, that Krishna wants us as I said in my words that we not uh, do too much, which is not good for us. Too much, fa uh, too much fasting or some stuff like this. He wants us to be happy. If, if, uh, is this correct? Did I understand you correct? I'm saying uh, unnecessary uh, austerities. Just like because Krishna, Krishna loves you and doesn't want you to torture yourself for his sake, in his name. Yes. But, if but I, I, I do fast. I, I fast on Ekadasi. I've been fasting uh, every Ekadasi. I do a complete fast 
since uh, 1986. I do 80% of them near jaw. And I do it because it's not so difficult for me. But and some, some people would see this as a, as a torture. Do you know what I mean? Very yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I understand because my wife, uh, for her to fast means not to eat between breakfast and lunch. That's, that's a long fast. So for some people it's a torture, for some people it's not, 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 so, not such a big deal. So yeah, I don't think it should, uh, it should do things. Um, you see, again, Krishna is a loving father. He doesn't, you have a father, right? Hopefully. You do? All right. So what if you go in front of your dad and, and grab a couple of long nails and put them inside your neck and then, you know, just hang yourself upside down from a tree from one foot and uh, or, or just uh, how is your father going to enjoy that? I, I, you, and you can say, I'm doing it for you, daddy. Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so just give Krishna what Krishna wants. Be moderate. Just if Krishna wants you to chant uh, 16 rounds a day, minimum. Uh, that's an austerity for a lot of people. So do that. Krishna wants you to offer your food to him. Do that. Krishna wants you to read the scriptures. Do that. To associate with the bodies. Do that. Do give Krishna what Krishna wants. Torture doesn't work. Even, even they, they just, you know, people who have uh, any, enemy armies, they capture, um, they capture other soldiers. They know that torture won't, you know, they, if you torture someone, they will say anything just to stop the torture. They won't tell you the truth. So torture doesn't work in the material world or in the spiritual world. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Welcome. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna yes. Prabhu. Can I ask a question here? Thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. Um, Nanai. Hare uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Prabhupada writes quite often uh, about working on behalf of Krishna and uh, understanding the will of Krishna. How, what is a, how to understand these things in practical terms? Well, Prabhupada asked us to tax our brains. It, it wasn't just to figure out how to cheat people out of their money. This is, this is what Prabhupada meant. You have to uh, figure out what Krishna wants from you. And it may take you a while. It may take you a while. Krishna some, doesn't want to give you things in a, a in a, in a tray here, I'll do the whole work for you. Although, to be truthful, the saintly people, the sadhus, have done the homework for us. They already have del, uh, delineated what the process is. And uh, you can see that the Goswamis um, and, and their scriptures and, and what they wrote, the uh, nectar of devotion, nectar of instruction, the satsandarvas, the, uh, you know, Hari Bhakti Vilas, they, they, just, they just tell you, you know, here, this is, these are the guidelines for you to practice devotional service because the goal is devotional service. Devotional service is so strong, so strong that Krishna will be conquered by it. Krishna is not conquered by anything. You cannot convince Krishna of anything because he has everything. What, what is a gift for someone who has everything? Love. Because that they don't have unless you give it. So these are the guidelines, meaning these are the, uh, the guardrails on the road. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. You know, there's, a, there's a precipice on one side and there's a mountain on the other side. Do, do not drive past those guardrails. So the scriptures are there to guide you and, and to have a smooth ride. But the, the purpose... It's always the same, is to increase or awaken our love for Krishna. The love is there. Actually, technically, everybody's a devotee. Everybody you see, every, every living entity, the plants, the trees, 
the animals, the humans, and the devotees. They're all devotees, but they're in different states of denial and ignorance and forgetfulness. So just try to follow the footsteps of the, those who know what they're doing and you will be successful because there is no, um, there is no prank. Krishna is not trying to trip you up. Krishna is trying to help you out. Just like uh, in the story of the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Gopa Kumar, he, he was hesitant. He didn't know, and actually I didn't either. What, what will happen <clears throat> when we go back to the spiritual world? Are, are we gonna be ridiculed? Saying, ha ha, where have you been? You, you've, been a, you've been a nasty person for millions of lifetimes. How, how does that feel? No, Krishna actually embraced Gopakumar and said, I missed you, just to show him his love. So that's it, it's, it's like stop embracing the in, inanimate, cruel features of the material world and work on your practice, how you're gonna hug Krishna when you see him, because he's waiting for all of us. So turn, turn, your, turn your vision upwards instead of the other way. Uh, we can be uh, overly enthusiastic and think too highly of ourselves, or we can be on the other spectrum the other side of the spectrum and think very poorly of ourselves. Neither, neither of them help the process. You should understand where you're standing and tax your brain and say, how do I get to the next, next program? Where am I at? It's like you have to have a GPS and you know where you're going, but do you know where you are? Do you know how far have you gotten? That's what you have to work on to see where you're at and how to go to the next, to the next step. Just don't get lost in the, on the road. Is that okay, Prabhu? Kondus no kenosk. Thank you, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> 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 you, have you been to Oslo, Prabhu? No, never been to Norway. I, I hope one day I'm invited to go and, and we, can, we can talk together. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Very well. Anything else from you? So if there are no further questions, we will conclude with that. And uh, we would like to thank you, Sarvatma Prabhu, for this nice lecture and this very insightful and practical Q&A session. Uh, we hope to see you again very soon. And uh, thanks to all those of you who have joined in this Zoom call, Tusen Tag Oslo and hope to see you all again. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank, thank you to all of you. And I hope to see you again soon as well. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.